So hold me a moment. Okay, so how is that? Yes, That's very fine. clear. So all we need now is for Massimo to um, to turn up. Hello, Nayla. Hello, Priscilla. Hello. Didier, how are you? Hello. I'm fine, how are you? We need Auntie oh, Randy, yeah. who um, doesn't always turn up, but hopefully he'll be here at Massimo. No. Have oh. right, Auntie's now turning up. Hello, Auntie. Hello, good. So, let me introduce you to your fe fellow panel members. I, I, I don't know if everyone knows each other. Um, so, Anti, there's uh, Didier, uh, Nayla, um, Priscilla, Christian, of course, you know, uh, Sorin is uh, is here, and we're just waiting for Massimo. He's coming. Oh, he's come. Yes. Okay, so he's for, gone, for everybody, just to, um, to, just to make it clear, um, I, I will say more about this when the time comes, because the time is tight. Uh, the, the order for the session today is to be found in the chat. So if you click on chat, we've got the 10 minute order and then the 20 minute discussion at the end. So should I start? Um, yes, I uh, think. Um, we could start. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, welcome everybody to this roundtable discussion. And um, as Paul has already said, the order is in the chat, and we are having a roundtable discussion around the subject of semiotic analysis, new perspectives, and we are going to start with Christian Bangov. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, as I explained before, a uh, few minutes, um, I had to Christian, your speaker is off. Sorry. Okay. I will not repeat everything I said until now, but I'll go to the point. No, um, it's a kind of coincidence that uh, the topic of my keynote speech is exactly about a new innovative uh, approach of semiotic analysis. I call it semi-economic uh, analysis. Um, so now I will just make a kind of trailer of my presentation tomorrow because um, I cannot uh, go in detail in 10 minutes. And then uh, I would expect you for tomorrow. Then I'm very sorry I will miss the uh, discussion because I'm very, very interested in um, this uh, innovative method of semiotic research, which come from uh, every part of the world. And uh, I um, wish to, to, to say thank you to Paul Cobley to put this uh, on in agenda. So what I mean with semi-economic um, analysis, uh, this is a research which I pushed forward from the last uh, four or five years. Uh, the point here is that um, the new means of communication change the tissue, the DNA of, of cultural content. Uh, my deep conviction is that um, the classical, I would say, textual textualist models in uh, for semiotic analysis are not working with uh, interactivity. So uh, my first major claim is that um, new media uh, experiences, the ex this communication of experiences, which are is now everywhere, the sharing of experiences, the 
uh, interaction taking place uh, everywhere in this new digital culture are um, escaping the grasp, the theoretical grasp of the classical textualist um, approach, which I consider so far the utmost achievement of semiotic analysis. This has to be underwise. So I'm criticizing in a way the um, uh, classical text of the Graymassian uh, uh, paradigm and uh, many sa satellite uh, approaches, but I'm criticizing it with the deep conviction that this is the model to be followed. So what I'm trying to uh, suggest as a new methodological, new, new way of uh, semiotic analysis is to preserve the um, theoretical perfection, the, the uh, deep uh, and multi-layer construction of this uh, method, the, the discipline, the methodological discipline within it, if possible, and to uh, invent something which uh, preserves all these uh, benefits of the method and uh, opens the, the, the semiotic reflection to the interactivity to uh, texts, or we can call them products, the, the multimedia products, which are uh, not fixed by writing, as is the essence of the texture, of the textualist approach. So what might be the uh, substitute of uh, the sign? Okay, then I develop a discourse about uh, what is economic value, and then that today, um, the, the moving force of the cultural exchange is gradually, I don't say it is already uh, something accomplished, but it is a working progress that commer the commercial principle penetrates and moves and establishes the logic of cultural exchange. And this is uh, definitely not my uh, idea. Uh, great minds like Jeremy Rifkin uh, wrote a lot about this commercialization of, of culture, how the uh, principle of uh, um, economic exchange penetrates the tissue uh, uh, of culture. And this, according to him, is a, a dangerous process. He's a very critical about this. I'm trying just to uh, open semiotics to be more uh, adequate to, to grasp this um, process. So uh, I use some um, ideas of what is uh, experience, because experience is a very um, large notion, very open. And uh, I do not claim that uh, anything which goes under the, the, the label of experience might be analyzed with, with an approach which I propose. But um, the way I conceive experience is a uh, Serial um, experience, experience made for commercial use or made possible uh, controlled experience because uh, interact uh, everything in our everyday life is uh, interactive. But uh, uh, this interaction, which is shaped in order to be reproduced in a serial way and to be uh, put on the on the market or to be capitalized by other means, not directly sold, but still um, shaped to be um, as much uh, liked and spread uh, among users of the internet as possible. These kind of experiences are the object of mine. Actually, I would like to open semiotics to this very. Uh, topical innovative area uh, of culture. So for, for many, this might be kind of, um, you know, semiotics um, getting lost in uh, domains which are not uh, semiotics business, but still uh, at least I'm trying to, uh, to open it. So uh, a very good uh, domain of analysis with very rich uh, background. This is the video games analysis. So uh, although I speak most of the time about experiences, actually, I give examples, concrete examples of uh, this semi-economic analysis with uh, video games. We are going to speak about uh, Tetris. We are going to speak about uh, Sims and uh, other uh, well-defined uh, expressions of interactive discourse um, 
creating narrative, creating possible worlds. So the bridge between the classical topics of semiotics and these new principles which move uh, present day uh, spreadable culture, uh, monetized uh, uh, content uh, will be my utmost uh, goal. But all this in detail uh, tomorrow. Now I cannot go uh, deeper. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian, for your uh, brief but interesting um, uh, perspective of semiotics. We will under, I understand we will see more details tomorrow, as now you, you have to go. Um, and therefore, um, yeah. I'm, I'm asking for Massimo to continue our roundtable discussion. Massimo Leone from... Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Paris. dear friends. Hi, hi. Bordeaux, hi. actually, at the moment. Bordeaux. It's, uh, it's a everyone. real pleasure. It's a real pleasure seeing you, dear Ripides. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and to see all the distinguished colleagues and, uh, and especially our wonderful organizers. So uh, I apologize once again to him for being uh, late because of uh, bad connection, Wi-Fi connection on my train this morning, but here I am. Um, I would like to share my screen if it's possible. I have a proper presentation. So, uh, the presentation I devised is only a few minutes. Um, its uh, uh, title is How to Recognize a Semiotic Analysis, so the, se the Seven Semiotic Virtues. Um, it's, it's something I've uh, uh, thought about after uh, some weeks, some months uh, of activity. Uh, working for this delightful uh, journal of the international semiotic community, which is uh, Semiotica. And um, uh, it, it is a privilege, it's really wonderful working for, for the journal. At the same time, something strange happens to the journal. We receive a lot of uh, uh, submissions that have nothing to do with semiotics. Um, and, uh, and, and and sometimes, you know, like uh, talking with, uh, 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 with the other editors in chief, my wonderful Canadian colleagues, Jim Pelkin and um, um, Stephanie Matthew Walsh, uh, we wondered you know, how, how can we decide what our article has nothing to do with semiotics? Because uh, if they submit, if an author submit an article to, to semiotic, it means that uh, this article must have something to do with, uh, with semiotics. And so when Paul um, uh, very generously invited me to contribute to this round table, I thought, well, actually, this is not so easy to answer. It's not so easy to decide, you know, what article has nothing to do with semiotics. And um, so I thought it would be better to define uh, this pertinence in positive term in positive terms, or, or would it be better to uh, to define this pertinence in negative terms so as an article or a proposal? What should it do? What it shouldn't do in order to to be pertinent for semiotics? And so I remembered that some years ago, um, out of a joke, uh, a little bit, I, I came up with uh, something that I delivered in a in a conference in. London. Um, it was a semi-fest, if I remember well, um, and it was the semiotic decalogue. So what what uh, one uh, is supposed to do according to my to my view, which is of course influenced by semiotics of religion, you know, Christianity, Catholicism. Um, so I came up with this decalogue, which was quite successful. Then it was uh, uh, seen on the internet a lot, and uh, it was a kind of a joke. So. Today, in uh, uh, thinking about uh, this new question, you know, how to define what a semiotic analysis is, I thought, well, but you know, as a good religious person in Christianity or, or in Catholicism, it's not enough to abide by the Ten Commandments, because you should also uh, live in accordance with the so-called seven virtues. So the cardinal virtues and the theological virtues. So I tried to came up with, uh, this is uh, 
Botticelli's wonderful depiction of the seven virtues. And I tried to come up with the sem semiotic seven virtues, or the sem seven semiotic virtues. So as you know, the cate catechism of the Catholic Church defines virtue as habitual and firm disposition to do the good. So wh what is the semiotic good? And traditionally, the seven Christian virtues or heavenly virtues combine the four classical cardinal virtues of prudence, justice, temperance, and courage or fortitude with the three theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity. And these were adopted by the church uh, fathers as the seven virtues. So how could we translate these virtues which come from a very long tradition, which actually predates Christianity you know, from Aristotle? Uh, how could we translate them in semiotic terms? Well, first of all, prudence. Uh, what is prudence in, in the terms of semiotic analysis? Uh, I would say, don't be so sure about the novelty of your analysis. Revise the state of the art. So um, many semiotic articles just tackle some problems that they think they are completely new and unexplored. And then it will be sufficient to flick through the you know, hundreds of issues of semiotica to realize that there is a, a very abundant semiotic literature about it. And probably uh, I would say that each new uh, semiotic analysis should start with a revision, a critical revision of the state of the art, which should read what other people have written before us. Then justice, don't force semiotics on your object of analysis, rather make it resonate with it. I mean, the purpose of semiotics is not to uh, transform a, every kind of object into an excuse for publishing, you know, like there should be actually a purpose in applying semiotics to a certain object. So it's very frequent to see articles that uh, say something and then they just, you know, drop some semiotics here and there to justify the fact that they want to, you know, the author wants to publish for social semiotics or semiotic. Then temperance, be humble with your findings, open to reconsider them if better analysis arise, which is um, very important, but uh, often neglected by semiticians. Uh, often they present their analysis uh, as though they were final statements on a certain matter. This is never the case in humanities. So uh, an analysis should be uh, proposed in order to be improved by definition. Then courage. I would say that a good semiotic analysis should be Amble with uh, um, uh, its hypothesis. Um, uh, I'm sorry, bold with its hypothesis, but stalwart in methodology. So it's it's very good to have, especially young semiticians, come up with uh, very courageous hypotheses. But at the same time, you know, the more an hypothesis is courageous, the more the methodology should be um, absolutely um, um, uh, immaculate. And then faith. Trust the tradition of your discipline. Don't be afraid of using the words semiotics, semiotics, semioticians, and all the other useful technical terms in the field. You know, there are many good semiotic articles that are almost um, afraid or worried or ashamed of uh, using the word semiotics. You know, like uh, many articles talk about multimodality, for instance, but they, they're actually articles about semiotics. Um, so uh, probably we should be proud of this of this word and all the words that compose the lexicon of uh, semiotics. Then hope, be confident that if your analysis is good, it will be well received by all those who are able to recognize academic value, be they semioticians or not. So a good semiotic analysis is actually um, destined to be uh, well received even by no semioticians. And a, a, a bad semiotic analysis probably will be badly received by semioticians too. So I really believe that there is a quality in analysis that transcend even the frontiers of uh, methodology. Uh, it befalls the common sense of academic value. And then uh, charity, be ready to disseminate your knowledge open access, which is I think, more and more important. Uh, I really push um, scholars to, of course, uh, publish in the usual prestigious venues of semiotic about the same time. It's very important that our so semiotic analysis circulate 
especially among the younger scholars and uh, those who have, have less access uh, to um, important uh, bibliographic databases uh, so that, uh, that semiotic analysis really becomes a sort of a global collective venue. So I hope you, you're going to agree with these uh, seven virtues. Otherwise, there are always the seven sins of semiotics. But uh, about the seven sins of semiotics, we're going to talk on another occasion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Massimo. Very useful and creative uh, way to understand the, the semiotic perspectives. And uh, I, I hope this is circulated and goes around as, as a guidance to submit journal papers. Um, Okay, let's move on now to Paul Cobley. Thank you, Evripides. Um, it's another instance today of where the main proceedings start and then we have a welcoming ceremony. So th this is a welcoming ceremony for this, um, this round table. Um, and really what we are doing here is launching two uh, projects. One project is uh, the discussion of semiotic analysis so we're inaugurating that and initiating that now um i'm not saying that nobody's spoken about semiotic analysis before um but we're thinking of new ways we're thinking of defining we're thinking of uniting and we're thinking about um getting rid of sectarianism both globally and both in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, disciplines and uh, practices as well, which is a kind of IASS uh, initiative. Um, so that's semiotic analysis. The other thing is that this, this session is designed to, uh, to launch a special interest group. Okay, so uh, two strands to, to what we're doing today. So just to recap, we've got a new initiative to explore the possibility of uniting different semiotic perspectives in an overarching semiotic analysis. And the reasons that uh, we think that that's important is that increasingly when scholars internationally are involved in, for example, writing research proposals, or even re writing research proposals for um, PhDs rather than for trying to gain funding from grant awarding bodies. One of the things that we are pressed to reveal is our methods. Okay, what, what forms of analysis will we use? And increasingly the people who are looking at research proposals, they're, they're very pressed, they're very rushed, um, that they want proposals which are very recognizable in terms of their frameworks and uh, uh, the, the, um, their structures um, and the, the kind of vocabulary that they use. And so occasionally you will see that the phrase semiotic analysis, but often you will see lots of phrases which are taken as uh, acceptable um, and the phrases that are anal uh, sorry, allied to, um, to semiotic analysis, for example, critical discourse analysis, it, people know immediately now it's been, been um, extraordinarily successful that critical discourse analysis is, is something that's acceptable in the academy and uh, c can be uh, a measure somehow of the credibility and the, the rigor of uh, a research proposal. Now, semiotic analysis, as a, a, a phrase, doesn't quite have at the moment that kind of respectability, partly because it's uh, sometimes considered to be old fashioned, but partly, I think, and possibly predominantly to do with the fact that semiotic it's, analysis means so many different yeah. things. Uh, may I ask uh, for um, Oscar Castro to switch off the microphone, please? Thank you. Sorry, Paul. It's actually, Paul, Paul is a ventriloquist. You know, so. Yeah, I, I was interested to hear whether that taxi was going to come on time. Sorry. Um, 
Where was I? Yes, so uh, the, the other issue with semi semiotic analysis is it's it's not unified. Okay, and there are good reasons, good disciplinary reasons for it not to be unified. Um, and, you know, no doubt we will go over some of them here, uh, both in the in the roundtable statements and in the discussion as well. But there are also good pragmatic reasons why we might want to think about presenting a, a unified semiotic analysis. So the other part of the initiative is to reawaken the idea of special interest groups in the International Association for Semiotic Studies. It's not a new idea. The idea was put forward in 1996 by Jeff Bernard. And if you are um, members of other scholarly associations, you know that routinely it will be the case that they will announce the, the opening of a, a special interest group in, I don't know, I'm, I'm in, a, in some communication um, scholarly societies and they have like a philosophy of communication, political economy of communication and so on. They have special interest groups of that kind. But what the IASS is doing, and this is the, the first uh, such concrete instance of this, we are seeking to give a little bit of funding to start special interest groups that we identify in the first instance and then they will um, they will elect themselves in subsequent years. So one issue that we we found particularly pressing was this one of um, of semiotic analysis. <coughs> and I mean, just to give you a broad sense of, um, of the remit, is we will be expecting the special interest groups to be led by people in different different areas globally, but different areas semiotically as well. And I will be introducing to you um, shortly, or every piece will be introducing to you shortly, um, Didier from France and uh, Priscilla from uh, from Brazil, um, who will uh, hopefully be able to lead this special interest group after we've um, continued our meeting today. Um, so, so there will be that dimension, and hopefully, what we'll produce is a number of um, conference presentations, possibly at the, the World Congress next year. And then ultimately, with all the um, collaborators of this special interest group, not an edited collection, that's very much expected. That's that's what uh, traditionally happens now. People have a conference and they want to get the um, proceedings put into a special issue or into an edited collection. But instead, to force the issue, and I don't know whether this will work, but to force the issue of unity on semiotic analysis, we'll have a joint authored book. I don't know if it's going to work, but it's worth a try. So uh, that broadly is what we um, what we seek to do with uh, with the special interest group initiative and the roundtable today. Um, I should say two more things. I should say something about the people who are about to um, to, to follow uh, me. We've had Christian and uh, Massimo. I think that you you have got a very strong sense of uh, even in that short space of time what uh, what they had to say on on semiotic analysis. Um, we have uh, Naila um, who will um, who will follow me. Um, uh, I saw in Sofia uh, a time when my faith was waning in discourse analysis as part of of semiotics in general i saw a fantastic presentation that she gave that completely changed my mind we have um, uh, priscilla following her who is um, to my mind the the leading um theorist of uh, percy and sign types who's writing now um she's carried the mantle from um from floyd merrill so very uh, valued member of um, of this community in that respect, we have uh, Didier from uh, from Limoges, um, who uh, I think more than anybody has uh, has thought through uh, semiotic analysis in so far as we conceptualize it in applied spheres. Um, and then finally, before we launch into discussion, we will have uh, Anti Ramvir 
um, who for many years was uh, was the pioneer of Tartu in carrying forward um, semiotic analysis of, of culture. Um, so I, very briefly, just to give you my position, I, I suppose in a, a way I've got two minutes left, in a way uh, I might, for the, for the purposes today, represent uh, biosemiotics in terms of, um, of semiotic analysis. And I, I have just two things to say, um, really. And, um, you know, I, I imagine that we can find affinities uh, around these, these two things that I have to say. First thing, from a biosemiotic perspective, I think that any semiotic analysis corresponding with both uh, Christian statements and Massimo statements must proceed from the idea that we know that there are signs. Humans as a semiotic animal are different from other animals because they know that there are signs, which is to say, we don't just consume signs, but we read them. Okay, and even with undergraduates, I, I, I try to teach that, that we're not in the, the, the business of consuming signs. We do consume signs, plenty of people do consume, consume signs, but we read them. Okay, or if you wanted to put it another way, we analyze them. Uh, and then the other strand I would say to a, a biosemiotic perspective on uh, semiotic analysis is that it needs to be, an analysis of this kind needs to be a projection. Okay, also in common with the, um, the semiotic animal, also in common with the human. It needs to have some dimension in which there's a thinking forward to the future partly from a critique of the situation that obtains in the present. And I'll say no more than that, because it gets complicated. I'll pass over to you, Evropidis. Thank you very much for clarifying. And the, the, the whole initiative poll is very useful and definitely will be beneficial in the semiotic fields and we we'll definitely look forward to bring something more concrete together from national university of colombia neila good afternoon all my friends my college all uh, good afternoon uh, i i i want to uh, uh, greetings to all the academics in this uh, round table. Uh, thank you very much. My, my uh, presentation is about met oh my God. Methodological exploration, uh, multimodal and multimedia discourse in contemporary society is one a little approximation. The pioneering research in direction of the study of multimodal discourse is located on huts and creds and creds and valuing. Uh, the following route is formulated first, the script explain and understand the connection between communication and the ways in which we represent the social reality through the concretion and distribution of knowledges materialized in multi-signal discursive expressions and its social distribution through resource and technological tool. Second, the importance of social factors in the creation and distribution of the meaning that is appropriate and used in the communicative interaction. Three, the research has focused on semiotics becoming the axis of, uh, of the exploratory power for creating meaning. I'm sorry, Neila, your microphone. Yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Excuse me, please. Uh, you need to I come back or not? It's necessary. I don't. Uh, just for the next slide only. Okay. 
principle, give one, give an account of the social function of semiotic resource. Second, identify and explain the use and significant practice of visual acoustic, tactile and olfactory nature, which are embodied in communication. Three, exploring the potential of meaning in semiotic units also come from their materiality, distribution, support, forms of processing and social cultural convention and determination. Four, analyze the value of the context of use highlighting the social, historical, political and cultural and course. Microphone is off again, I'm sorry. Neila. Yes, yes. yes. I don't know what happened, excuse me. This course being scientific in consistence that produce and socialize meaning through te technological tools, record an explanation to of each of the semiotic modes and their supports with the same analytical and explanatory compromise. The materialized semiotic modes enable per semiotics categories crucial for the understand of how they operate when the qualisignet, synsignet, and legisignet character is determined, from which the process of both production and interpretation of significant practice are approached. This set of principles determines the transdisciplinary nature of multimodal, multimedial, critical discourse studies. Search my strengthment by semiotic studies. Studies on multimodal, multisignic, and multimedia discourse, technological score, need to be explored from their design, production, and distribution process. The support is to evidence and map. But one, the relation between modes. Second, the interaction. Three, the social practice. Four, the special temporalities. Five, the artifacts or supports for its social distribution. Six, the multidimensional multi device. Seven, links, documentary records, electronic files, and others. In this way, to recognize and explain individual and collective practice, explore memories and identities. The multimedia character of the speech imposed the need to explore the device defined as, and it seems that somehow has the ability to capture, give, determine, intercept, model, control, and ensure the gestures, behaviors, opinion, and speeches of the living beings. The need to integrate multiple methods and methodologies allows addressing complex phenomena such as the media representation of structural social problems. Methodological contribution to file on multimedia, multimodal and multimedia critical discourse studies. One, dynamics. Reconstruct in a plural way the process of the signification and effect the social problem represented. Actors. Two. Media communication is a social activity that involves a multiplicity of actors, diverse emotion, rationalities, and motivation, dissimilar purpose and interest. Three. Positioning. Qualitative interpretation of the date, of the date, of the data, excuse me and the research point of view. Reproductibility, possibility to reply the research from the epistemic methodological connection. The need to adjust the research method and techniques to the type of sample addressed is recognized. This implies the articulation of the theoretical philosophical component with the technical one that derives from the application of multivariate analysis strategies. 
the proposed combines the result of the textual statistical analysis with the methodological contribution of the field of multimodal and multimedia critical discourse studies to develop a comprehensive vision, recognize the limits and any purpose of this nature. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you very much, Neila, for your presentation. And we can now proceed with uh, Priscilla Borges from the University of Brasilia. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for the invitation and for the generous presentation. And thank you for the organizers for this wonderful event. It's my pleasure to be here with such distinguished uh, scholars. Uh, to answer the question, what is needed uh, for an analysis to be semiotic, I choose to observe the semiotic analysis in academic texts to search for the elements that may characterize a semiotic analysis. Please note that my observation is restricted to Persian semiotics, my field of research. Thus, uh, in what follows, I focus on these particular semiotics and not on semiotics in general. For didactic purposes, um, we could divide semiotic analysis according to, three to the three branches of semiotics, uh, speculative grammar, critical logic, and methodeutic. As far as I've seen, uh, the majority of the analysis can be located in the first branch, speculative grammar. Semiotic analysis in this branch employ the famous classes of science. Some of them choose only one aspect of the sign relation, the iconic, for instance, uh, to analyze signs in the field of art, music, dance, and films. Uh, or yet the indexical uh, aspect to analyze photographic images, documentaries, and reality shows. In this approach, a sign feature is chosen, is chosen as being predominant, and this feature is analyzed in detail sometimes obfuscating the relations between the classes of signs, other times pushing the other classes of signs involved in the semiotic process to the background. If in one hand, this type of semiotic analysis may allow a deeper dive into the chosen aspect, revealing subtleties and details of a given type of sign. On the other hand, such precise cut in one aspect of the sign may end up overshadowing the semiotic process and the interrelation between classes in semiosis. But there is another group of analysis in the branch of speculative grammar, in which the classes of signs are employed as a guide, a parameter for the observation and analysis of phenomena. In this analysis, the variety of types of signs and their relationships are brought to the foreground. Such analysis tend to show a web of chained signs working together to configure the observed phenomenon and indicate possible interpretative trends. Semiotic analysis made to evaluate products and advertising campaigns, for example, tend to adopt this method. Uh, a problem we find in some of these analyses is that more often than not, they do not advance beyond the system of three classes of signs uh, with its famous triad the, uh, of iconic indexical and symbolic signs. Although very frequently in Peirce's text, this triad only considers the relationship between the sign and its object, uh, an analysis and an analysis restricted to the single triads ends up ignoring the interpretant and its relation to the sign producing a rift in Peirce's triadic concept of, concept of sign. As a consequence, the chain of sign is severed. Uh, this, the result is, is avoided when one employs the system of 10 classes of signs, which includes both the sign relations to its objects and to its interpretants. When approaching critical logic, the second branch of Peirce's semiotics, the analysis start to emphasize discussions about the validity or strength of arguments. 
and their claim to a possible truth. Such analysis focus on the relationship between interpretants and objects. This relationship, of course, depends on mediation of the sign. But in these analysis, the sign is not on the foreground. Rather, they evaluate the adequacy or the degrees of correspondence between interpretants and objects. For instance, the connection between a conclusion and its premise. Analysis approaching methodeutics focus on the relations between signs and their interpretants, and more specifically on the methods of conducting an investigation and its capacity to give some assurance about the value of the knowledge produced by the interpretants. These analyses employ the famous triad of types of reasoning, abduction, deduction, induction, in these days of fake news, these are being mobilized very frequently. The focus on interpretants brings us closer to another type of analysis that transits between semiotics and pragmatism. At this point, it's, it's clear that the limits between analysis strictly semiotic and analysis based, based on Peirce's philosophical concepts cannot be defined precisely. This semi uh, Peirce's semiotics is part of a philosophical system and therefore it carries, carries with it philosophical principles, principles from which we, uh, it cannot be severed at the risk of disfigurating Peirce's semiotics. What is common to all these types of analysis is that, and I think Paul is, is going to agree with me, <laughs> All of them begin with the perception of all things as signs. Knowing that signs cannot represent their objects completely, only partially, all semiotic analysis begin by presupposing that there is something lack, lacking, that our experience with the phenomena are not complete. Uh, the, and that analysis in this way do, do better uh, comprehend these, these gaps. Né? The analysis in this uh, is the way to better comprehend the, uh, the gaps and their implications. Realizing that all things work as signs means that we begin an analysis doubting the phenomenon. Through semiotic analysis, we can mediate between reality and illusion, finally accomplishing what Dili and Sibioc thought was the mission of semiotics. And I'm pretty sure, although I have made this analysis thinking only on a particular semiotics, that we can uh, think of this mission uh, for semiotics in general. Thank you. Thank you very much, Priscilla, for your enlightening presentation. Um, we can now move to uh, Didier Salaifa from University of Limoges. Is it possible to share my screen or, or not? Yes, you can share your screen. How oh, do I proceed? I don't know why. How to proceed? Wow. Okay. Now. This one. Okay. Great. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, to have invited me in for this round table. Firstly, as uh, usual, I'm French, so I would like to apologize for my English, my bad English, but I'll try to do my best to be clear. Okay. Thank you. I will, talk, I will talk about, uh, I would like to talk about Gramscian perspective and uh, about the structure. Because in Gramscian perspective, the structure is firstly the richness of uh, this methodology and is also its poorness. I would like to show how. In Gramscian uh, perspective, semiotics analysis is fundamentally about the structure. That is to say, the meaning is not all something that is given. The meaning is something we have to articulate. It's a result of this articulation 
Grimacian semiotics involved itself in lecture from semiology that focused primarily on what is understood instead of how the meaning is constructed. As we know today, the first model that we have that have been mobilized in this way was mainly the narrative scheme and the semiotic square. Things were going as if the meaning is kind of architecture that we can construct and deconstruct. In this perspective, Grimacian, Grimacians operate as if they were mechanic. Then mixed semiotic analysis was as only talk about formal relationships inside system. Uh, this approach began to be questioned to questions in the, at the turn of 19th when some semioticians started to talk about subjectivity and about the meaning as not only a holistic structure, but also the fact of points of view. Thus, the era of point of view in discourses has arrived. It was developed from proposition of Maurice Merleau-Ponty and Husserl about the perception. If it was about the structure here, attention has been put on the way in which the enunciation acts on the constitution of universes of meaning. If there was a meaning here, it was about the confrontation between extensivity of the world, what we have in front of us, and the intensity we deploy to restitute this world as something perceptible and understandable. In this way, finally, the meaning as a result of articulation inside structure is permanently about negotiation. In other words, that's how Grimacian semiotics started to, excuse me, <clears throat> started to uh, switch from a very programmatic approach of the meaning to a sensible one by taking into account the fact that the meaning is also, or perhaps firstly, about interactions. That was the hypothesis of semioticians as Jacques Geninaska or Landowski, for example. For those two, analyze is not only to try to classify, it's also to talk about the rationalities that are in the basis of this classification. For Geninaska, these rationalities are about the capability we have to grab aesthetically the world. For him, we can grab the world by focusing on dependency relationship between figures, concept in one part and their, and their reference in other part. We can grab the world by establishing schematic and categorical equivalence inside the same level of discourse. And we can grab the world by focusing on the rhythm by which things are coming to us. And for Landowski, these rationalities are about the way by which we interact with the world when it's given. The world can be given as a program without surprise. Run is run or eat is eat. It can, the world can be given to by manipulation. Someone or something push us or help us to reach to the world. It can be given also randomly as an accident. Things are here without any logic, like an accident, and the world can be given by adjustment. That is to say, by immersion, the world we have, we are in contact with, is like every time in acquaintance with what we feel and what we are. To an, this an, analyze, thus, Analyze is to try to restore the efficiency of this acquaintance. For example, between the violinist and his violin, the meaning is not 
the, the very important here is not on one with the violinist or in other with the violin, but the relationship between them. That's how we can catch the meaning between the violinist and his violin. What about the structure here? It's clear that we need to move from what is defined it mainly as a program to the reason why it starts to become other. For example, if someone asks me to describe a religious ceremony at a church or a mosque one day, it's obvious that what is expected is not only to talk about the ritual that defines this ceremony. There is no really meaning here. What could be expected is to talk about all the other various things that take place during the ceremony. That is what makes the sense of this particular ceremony. According to an anthropologist named Albert Piet, I used to talk about here about the structure in manner of mode. Um, to define this way to approach the meaning. What is the point? It seems certain that to speak of the meaning in any given universe is to talk about many ontologies. That's very important. A religious ceremony is about the ritual, but it's also about many other things, what we can call ontologies. The meaning of this ceremony is about how we switch from, from one ontology to another, from the ritual, which is the same concerned by this ceremony, to the way that the faithful are looking each other, for example. Depending, for example, to architecture or the moment, this interaction will be not the same. That's how it's possible to perceive the meaning of the ceremony by looking things that are not inside the ceremony, but things that are around the ceremony in minor status. We're still in the structure, but this structure is fundamentally dissipative. This is the path to adopt. Excuse me, this is the path I, the path I adopt to formalize this new perspective of semiotics analysis. If you are able to, if you are able, excuse me, to analyze, it's like in one reality, we have many ontologies. The path from one ontology to another is what makes us catch the meaning, not in its generosity, but in its singularity. That is the perspective where the post gramscian semiotics start to move. Singularity is about the paradox. And for me, the meaning is about the paradox. Thank you, and very sorry about my very bad English. Thank you very much, Dieter. Your English were fine. We understood exactly what you were saying. And we are ending the roundtable discussion with Antti Radvir from the University of Tartu. Hello. So, uh, <clears throat> after uh, a couple of thousands of years of uh, development, semiotics seems to have today reached the point in time in which our own president has uh, uh, summoned this meeting in order to talk about new perspectives in semiotics or maybe even more revolutionary ideas. So, of course, the question then uh, can be set whether something is wrong with semiotics or something is wrong with our own dear president. But um, uh, assuming that uh, there really <clears throat> should be uh, uh, asked questions about the disciplinary identity of semiotics, I would like to make uh, three very brief points. <clears throat> uh, the first of which uh, 
um, concerns the um, object level of semiotics in the sense as uh, semiotics has um, always uh, made it very clear that uh, we are dealing really with a meaningful world. We are analyzing the semiotized uh, reality. We are not pretending to uh, get in touch with some sort of uh, hypothetical objective or ontologically objective um, reality. Uh, in this sense, uh, we are uh, differing from the so-called hard sciences, but we also are differing from many uh, social sciences that uh, see the possibility of study the uh, human um, social or cultural associations by uh, certain uh, um, as if getting in touch with the objective epistemical uh, reality by um, capturing that reality to some sort of recording um, devices or the like. What I keep in mind was, uh, of course, <clears throat> uh, outlined or brought to the stage of discussion already by uh, philosopher Bertrand uh, Russell, who uh, asked also the uh, asked also about relations between hard sciences and the so-called humanities? Russell then uh, pointed out that uh, the hard sciences are uh, indeed a kind of um, uh, field of pretension. Uh, of getting in touch with that uh, ontological uh, objective reality that is uh, surrounding the uh, human, social and cultural world. And Russell, of course, then uh, uh, had the opinion that uh, hard sciences approach the reality out there through uh, the gadgets, measuring techniques, rulers that um, reflect uh, the very human uh, cultural reality in the sense as uh, that cultural reality presupposes already certain aspects or dimensions in the physical world that um, should be uh, studied. Uh, ended, he ended up then uh, with a kind of logic of asking why um, length uh, should be uh, measured in centimeters, but not in, for example, uh, Fahrenheit uh, degrees. In this sense, uh, semiotics um, is, uh, of course, um, more honest, so to speak, as a discipline, and uh, definitely uh, a kind of a social uh, science par excellence, which um, uh, is connected also with um, the second uh, point in somehow defining the semiotic research perspective in the sense as um, uh, that was defined by Charles uh, Morris and uh, his division of uh, the semiotic perspective into the formal uh, meaning related and uh, functional uh, dimensions or the syntactic, semantic and pragmatic uh, uh, levels of semiotic study, which of course uh, then utterly move semiotics to the realm of social sciences in the sense as the pragmatic dimension presupposes the engagement of the um, informant uh, to the research table of um, semiotics. In this sense, uh, uh, every uh, aspect from that meaningful world uh, we are studying is not semiotized by the researcher, but by the um, 
object level, so to speak, uh, on its own already in the face of uh, concrete um, informants. Uh, a third aspect uh, that concerns um, the uh, probable necessity for somehow redefining uh, not only the semiotic uh, analysis, analysis, but um, the determines or the, uh, somehow um, uh, makes it necessary for the whole area of social sciences to reconsider our research perspective in the sense as um, uh, uh, the uh, world um, in which uh, humans today live is becoming more and more detached from the uh, hypothetical ontological objective um, reality. We are in this sense uh, um, living more and more uh, in the context of non-primary communication as it was uh, uh, conveniently for us, um, treated by Solomon Marcus, uh, the great Romanian, uh, when he was um, uh, describing the logic of the uh, of the creation of uh, pseudo uh, realities that are becoming uh, more and more uh, realistic in the a phenomena called virtual reality or mixed reality. Um, if we think about uh, the so-called Internet of Things or um, virtual financing, then <clears throat> it is clear that uh, human uh, associations are more and more inhabiting uh, auto-communicative um, uh, semiotic realities that uh, are becoming more and more detached from the uh, physical referential uh, reality. The, that reality in this sense is slipping away uh, from our research table, but curiously and perhaps unfortunately, uh, so is slipping away the category of uh, that informant uh, that was uh, demanded to be taken into account by Charles Morris in his pragmatic uh, research dimension of uh, semiotics. If we think about the, uh, the transfer of agency in the creation of information in uh, virtual reality, then it's clear that uh, not only indeed the referential reality, but the agency is also uh, slipping uh, uh, out of our uh, hands. In this sense, um, uh, it is probably um, uh, a good time to reconsider uh, how uh, semiotics can put its finger back on uh, this uh, referential uh, uh, real uh, realities and can put uh, its finger back on the um, category of informant that is by nature defining the very nature of uh, any semiotic study. Uh, so these were um, the three points I guess I wanted to mention and um, thank you. Thank you Antti for sharing your views with us. Um, I will now go back to Paul who would like to share a slide with us just before starting a debate or a conversation, Paul? Yes, just, just a little bit of um, advertising um, before I um, get involved in the discussion along with the rest of you and along with the audience. Um, I'll just share screen for a moment and I'm looking for PDF. which I can't find for some reason. 
I'll try desktop. Is everyone seeing that? I just, just wanted to, to mention the part of our um, initiative with uh, the special interest groups, although some of us are veterans, hopefully will involve early career researchers. And I just wanted to flag up this event. We'll do this a couple more times, no doubt, when we're on round tables and in uh, conference sessions of the early career researchers second meeting, second global meeting, um, and this has been led by uh, by Naila and uh, uh, Bianca Suarez, and it's called Paths, Scenarios, Methodologies, and Semiotic Roots. Um, so that's the second um, early careers, uh, early career researchers uh, session, and that will be in September and October of this year. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, we we can now open the the floor to questions from the audience or uh, among the speakers. If anyone would like to address some thoughts, and um, Paul, um, we are trying here also to uh, help you in putting together this idea as well. Therefore, it would be wise to take this opportunity now. So, Ivan. Yes, uh, thank you for this great panel. I was really excited to uh, listen to it because it really, really resonates with many of my own uh, interests and I, I'd be happy to join this uh, special interest group if, if it's possible. Uh, but uh, the thing that I wanted just to comment on, uh, going back to what um, Massimo and Paul uh, were talking about, um, I think that is, uh, it's important to understand that there are uh, different fields uh, that can be kind of bridged with semiotics or uh, made part of semiotics maybe. Uh, and I, I would suggest for my, it's helpful for me at least uh, to, to split them into three groups. One of them is just when there's this task of relabeling the thing as Massimo said, like multimodality is uh, almost just an alias for semiotics. Uh, often. And the second group of uh, fields is this, like, feels like discourse analysis, when we have uh, some intuition that is something very uh, close to semiotics, even though some extra effort is necessary to bridge it. And there are more distant approaches that are also uh, have some things that can be connected to semiotics, like this nebula of uh, interpretivist approaches or phenomeno phenomeno phenomenological analysis or uh, social constructivist analysis and uh, the, a lot a lot more effort is necessary to bridge those more distant approaches but I think uh, this is also an important task and we really have to uh, understand it as a separate effort uh, as a separate field in in which we have to put effort in because uh, I, I guess this is not something that will be kind of observed absorbed into semiotics automatically this is something where we actually need to need to build some conceptual bridges, finding some uh, interface concepts to uh, connect, connect the disciplines. And I'm, I'm really happy that this uh, process is uh, happening and there are people who are interested in uh, making it real and happening. Yeah. Thank you. Massimo, do you want to respond? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very good point. Uh, I a dream of a time in which we'll go on TV and uh, we'll say, I am a semiotician with the same pride by which um, uh, virologists today say, I, I'm a virologist or am I an, I'm an epidemiologist, you know, like nobody, nobody actually <laughs> knew what an epidemiologist was uh, until like one year or two years ago. I have a good friend in Turin who is an epidemiologist and uh, we used to be friends because uh, we both had problems in explaining people what our work was but now you know he, he's so popular so we're not friends anymore um, but uh, but very soon very soon probably we'll uh, be able to rebrand also this idea of semiotics as a, 
as a way to uh, intervene uh, in, uh, in society uh, in a very effective way, especially in crucial times, like the times that we are living um, nowadays. Uh, but for doing so, it is important that uh, we don't accept marginality as a, as a, as a destiny. Uh, because sometimes uh, it is uh, uh, quite human to endorse and even to indulge in the feeling of being the underdog. Uh, it is important to gain centrality in institutions, in our universities, in cultural institutions, um, in, uh, in cultural politics. Uh, that, that is important because uh, the centrality of semiotics unfortunately cannot be gained only through the power of our ideas, which are of course splendid, but they're constantly in competition with other disciplines and methodologies. So it's important to negotiate a, a proper and fair space for semiotics. One, one thing I would add is, um, is that, you, you know, th there was every possibility that this discussion could have lapsed into um, to micro analysis, you looking at the little things that we need to do in order to do um, semiotic analysis, and you know, perhaps perhaps we do need to discuss that um, as a group globally. Um, but I, I, I like the way that the di discussion went. This is in response to your question, Ivan. Um, in particular, it's just a reminder of the yoke that we've been under with the rise of science in the last four uh, five hundred years. Um, I, I liked in particular uh, the way that Anti and uh, Didier spoke about uh, about ontologies, you know, and, and where we are placed as semiotics within um, within disciplines that require ontologies. We're much more uh, flexible than that. We're, we're going into an era where there's a, a, a great deal of uh, of call for for flexibility and recognition of fluidity, embodiment, and so on and so on. But we're also in an era where I, I, I think that in terms of being analytic, uh, the, there is uh, too, too easy the possibility of falling back into an algorithmic culture where you rely on everything to be um, be coded. So we're at a kind of crossroads, but well, probably always at a crossroads. But in particular, we're at that crossroads where there's um, there's an opportunity and a challenge. Okay. Any others? Thank you. Any others? Didier, I think he's going to switch his. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I can give an answer to to Ivan. Firstly, the semiotics is about the meaning. Don't have to forget this, this but it's very important. But sometimes by doing semiotics as kind of uh, technical things, we forget that, that. Semiotics is about the meaning. What I'll try to say is that if we, it's about the meaning, we have to accept that the meaning is not the same everywhere. That's why I start to talk about ontologies. To talk uh, to the meaning from a sign, it's not the same to talk about the meaning to the scenario. It's not the same to talk about the meaning in, uh, by talking about the human body and so on and so on. So we have to firstly to admit this starting point and then accept that the meaning is various. That the problem that the problem Gremessians uh, had, they stopped or the fixed semiotics as only a program. But uh, by working, they start to see that the meaning is not a program. It's a kind of construction, permanent construction. It's a change, every time it's change. And the, para the paradigm who helped the change to help is a paradox. How we switch to one thing to another. What's the meaning by this ontology and other ontologies? That's what I, I would like to say, and this is very important. And that's why semiotics is very important to the world. Today, we can use semiotics everywhere. Actually, I'm working with uh, medicine, for example. I start to work on how we can, uh, we can um, 
mix it, or I don't know how to say it in English. You can walk around the meaning for the elders, for example. It's not the same by taking semiotics in marketing, for example. So that's why I would like to focus on. The semiotic is about meaning, and the meaning is inside ontologies. We need to find and to know how to describe these ontologies. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I ask Priscilla um, about, uh, you spoke about the validity of meaning. How do you see this being clarified from the perspective and from the perspective of Pers, from the perspective, yeah, Persian perspective? Okay, I, I couldn't unmute me. <laughs> So sorry. Uh, uh, I think um, well, there is the, the there is uh, like a, a path between the classes of science that tries to to figure out how meaning is uh, being constructed in a context. The context is not given in the class of science, but the way to search the context may be given in this path. Uh, that, that the class of science um, um, design, let's say that. Uh, and actually, and truth is, is something in person that it's not given. And it, so there is a problem here. So truth with, uh, we, 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 we can't think of truth as something that it's given and that we are searching for it and that we will one day actually achieve it. So truth is something in the future um, that we will never achieve, but semiotics may, may, may help us to find the path to go closer to it or get closer to it. And, and, and in, this, in, in this process, it's possible that we are creating truth since, um, uh, and, and we are changing the place of it um, because uh, truth is something. It, it's um, uh, it's something that a community in the future would agree with. So uh, the community of inquirers are, agrees with it. But the community of inquirers is infinite, and and it's given in the future. So it's it's actually impossible to to really achieve the truth. But we are always trying to. To, 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 to make the connection between what's, going, what's being interpreted and what's the object of the sign. So trying to connect this, these two things, otherwise we are going to be in a completely insane world in, in which we cannot even communicate because you, you, a, a sign could, could have any meaning anyone wants it to, be, to have. So, I don't know, probably we are facing this and experiencing um, some discourses like this nowadays. Um, I, I'm, I'm dealing with it um, all days in my life <laughs> in Brazil <laughs> at this moment. So this is something that in Brazil is, is being uh, um, frequently discussed and based on person semiotics, specifically on one text. Uh, in which person says about uh, the, 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 the searching, the methods for searching and the, the scientific method that he calls it scientific method, but we could, ex we could see the scientific method in a more uh, open way, I think, not only to, to the academics, not only restricted to academics. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Paul, how, how do you see this uh, effort being coming together? How would you like to um, you see the future of this uh, idea evolving? Well, it, it's a risk. The, the entire um, operation is, is a risk because um, it takes enormous goodwill 
to even agree upon things that we already agree upon. So, uh, so in that sense, you know, it, it may not come off. But I, I think if if um, if we can draw up some principles in a fairly mechanical way about what regard, you know, what what pertains to um, uh, to semiotic analysis, if we can do some translation, um, you, you know, which is a, a, another Im, important thing. Even today, I, I'm I'm looking at the the responses and looking at the the ten minute presentations, and I'm thinking there's so much overlap, but sometimes we're speaking different. Uh, different languages or not languages but like vocabularies are, are, are very different um, speaking on a purely practical basis if we could finally produce a document that it would be easy for the international community to refer to and then say that is semiotic analysis then there's a chance that we will get some money you know when applying for grants when, when applying for promotion, um, I mean personally, if the money comes to me, I'm 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 happy. But like more uh, more importantly, um, it's part of another issue that we have uh, with um, with the international community. We've been trying to get um, semiotics instituted as a category in um, in UNESCO drop down menus. You know, and it's a matter of like getting us on the agenda in some sense. So, so there's some purely pragmatic uh, aspects. That there are some community, um, community directed dimensions of the the project, um, and there there are some uh, theoretical and philo philosophical um, issues that uh, that we hope to address in um, in what happens with this project. Incidentally, I think um, Thank something you. I wanted to yeah. um, to speak. I, I would like to thank everyone participating in this panel. I have just get I'm getting messages that it's time for us to end this roundtable session. Thank you very much to everyone, and we are definitely looking forward to this document. Paul, let us know. Let everyone know how we can contribute, how we can be of any help, or uh, you know, bringing this together will help us a lot to understand and claim uh, research funds and academic journals. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Nikolai. Yes, I, fo dear I follow. I follow your instructions. Yes, <laughs> of course. Thank you very much for helping. Anytime, I'll see you in the next session. It's, it's very useful for me to have uh, some uh, uh, friends around me these days. Of course, you do. Of course, you have. Thank Thanks you. A lot. Always welcome. Hello, Mikhail. Again, hello, Yanis. Samir, of course. Hello. I'm very happy to to exchange. Uh, some idea in the morning. Thank you, uh, the Professor. Thank you very much for the, uh, this uh, beautiful conference. See you. Thank you very much. See you. Thank you. <laughs>